So after many years in ministry uh, as a pastor, I've often fantasized or thought about, in a, in a sense, um, the classes I should have had when I was in seminary uh, that I wish I had uh, when I was in seminary, like a class on how when you baptize a baby, you don't make them cry, or uh, a class uh, I wish I'd had uh, in seminary about uh, you know, how to read a financial, church financial statement without getting totally confused. Maybe wish I'd been given a book, Church Budget for Dummies, uh, something like that. Or maybe uh, I wish I'd had a class on human resources and conflict, uh, HR and conflict and how to write personnel manuals or bylaws or, or manual of operations. They just didn't give you those kinds of classes when you were in a seminary, you had things about biblical interpretation and theology and all those meaningful uh, things that we engage in in pastoral ministry and great classes that have stood me in great stead, but yet I've often wondered, I wish, I wish, I know back in the 80s we had no idea this was happening, but I wish, and they probably are do now, had classes on social media. Um, I quite honestly, Dick and Bob, don't know how you got through ministry without email. I can't imagine what that was like. But I wish, I wish that I'd had a class on how to build a Facebook platform or how to understand how to make a tweet or, or how to organize my email without feeling buried and overwhelmed. Uh, those practical classes uh, would have, would have uh, been very meaningful and helpful as I have progressed through the years uh, in my ministry, and uh, not that anybody would listen to me, but I'd throw those ideas out there for sure. Now, one of the classes, as odd as this sounds, one of the classes that, uh, that I, would, I would hope that I could have taken in seminary that would actually would have been very helpful is Bread 101. Now, I know that sounds odd, but Bread 101, be, in part because Bread plays a significant role uh, in, in the Bible, in particular through the Gospels. In fact, our parable is taken from the Gospel of Luke, uh, and, it would, and, and the Gospel of Luke was often referred to by biblical scholars as the, the bread gospel. Um, bread plays a central, meaningful metaphor and uh, meaning for how Jesus saw himself and saw the world. Jesus was always, in fact, Part of the reason Luke's called the gospel of bread is he's always going around breaking bread with all these strange kind of people. He's referring to himself as the bread of life. He feeds 5,000 people with uh, five loaves of bread. He uh, speaks to his friends and he breaks the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. I think uh, it would have been great to have a deeper understanding of bread. And in particular, in our text this morning, of bread making. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like a woman who took yeast and mixed it in 60 pounds of flour. Now I'm going to be vulnerable this morning and confess to you, I have never made a loaf of bread. Now, that's not quite true. I've I've used a bread machine a couple of times, but that's not the same thing. So I will be honest, and as I had lived with this text this week, I had no idea, really, and I was so appreciative, Steve, of you explaining uh, in, in, in Young Church how yeast works and how a little bit of yeast is mixed in and, uh, and works to, to, to make the bread rise. Now, how many, and like Steve, hold your hand up again if you've made bread, if you uh, I, well, I'm kind of embarrassed now, to be honest, that so many know how to do bread, uh, and I'm coming here to preach about it, and I, had, I didn't have Bread Making 101 in seminary. I wish I had. But I do know, in reading this text, I do know that there is something kind of odd, and I could recognize it right away, not knowing much about yeast and how it makes bread rise and how it works, kind of 
chemical reaction, not knowing much about that. But I did notice this parable is a little strange, and it's very common how Jesus would take something very common and every day and make a little twist on it. And it occurs to me that a woman taking the yeast and mixing it with 60 pounds of flour is kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Has anybody here ever made use 60 pounds of flour? That's kind of, kind of crazy. And what exactly could Jesus mean by saying that? And so I, I, I used my computer skills I did not learn in seminary, and I Googled it. And I went online, and I said, well, how much yeast would it take to leaven 60 pounds of flour. Now, you bread experts, how much yeast do you think it takes? Do you have any idea? It was kind of startling. I, I, it, I guess it takes one to two teaspoons uh, for a pound of flour. People are nodding, so good. I, I, I found the right information. I don't want to be misquoted. One to two spe- teaspoons of yeast uh, for each pound, so that's 60 teaspoons of, um, of, of yeast in order to leaven 60 pounds of flour, which is about one and a quarter um, to two, two and a half uh, cups of yeast. Not a lot of yeast, to be quite honest, uh, to work. And again, I think it's related to how long it might take. You need to give it time, uh, many di- the temperature, many of the different factors. But it's obvious Uh, that uh, Jesus is talking about and comparing the kingdom of God to this yeast that is so small, so tiny, and yet it leavens everything. That's an obvious point of the parable, and I didn't need Bread Making 101 to notice that. But what exactly could that mean? for our discipleship as churches, as, as being disciples in the world. What exactly could Jesus be trying to tell us in saying the kingdom of God is this tiny bit of yeast that works in 60 pounds of flour? And the interesting line as it goes, it is, it, as it ends, that leavens all of it. Not just certain parts of it, but leavens the whole bread. What exactly is he trying to tell us about the kingdom? Now, Christmas is around the corner. Uh, I know it's hard to believe, but we'll probably start seeing, has anybody, we might start seeing Christmas decorations here in, uh, in, in the stores here pretty soon, once Halloween's gone and uh, we move quickly through Thanksgiving. But one of the things I know is going to happen Uh, in the coming weeks is that when Christmas comes around, they are going to show this one particular movie over and over and over again. You'll see, all of us have seen it. You know what I'm talking about. It's a wonderful life, right? With Jimmy Stewart. Uh, It's shown over and over again, and you always wonder why, uh, why show this movie over and over again. And you all know the story of uh, George Bailey, Jimmy Stewart, who plays George Bailey, who through a series on Christmas Eve, a series on unfortunate events, has decided that his life was not really worthy of anything. He decided uh, that he really uh, was more harmful to those around him than helpful. And of course, we know as he's about to jump off the the bridge, the story of the guardian angel uh, who comes and instead shows him and uh, has him through uh, uh, an evening see what the world would have been like if he hadn't lived in it. That as small as he felt, as, as tiny as he felt, that in truth, if he saw what had happened, he would realize his life mattered. Our lives matter. 
And like George Bailey, we may not have huge lives, in a sense, or do huge things that we think change the world. But the point is, it's the small acts that leaven the world. The small pieces of yeast that work um, quietly and silently and that work uh, invisibly yet somehow leavens the whole loaf. So in a sense, what Jesus is saying to his disciples and to us this morning is that your life matters. What you do matters. It may not seem big. It may not seem some grand thing that you think is going to change the world, but the reality that Jesus is saying is you're the yeast. That the kingdom of God works in you and through you to leaven the whole loaf. Think about that. Now I know past few weeks I have found myself uh, past few weeks, past months really struggling with um, with the reality of the conflict in our society and culture around us, really struggling with um, kind of even despairing somewhat. That we seem stuck in these patterns of injustice and patterns that we can't even communicate with each other, these patterns uh, that, are, that we seem so lost in, and it doesn't seem, no matter if I imagine myself doing something, that it really, really makes a difference. And so I hear the words of Jesus this morning, and what I hear is, yes, it does. That a woman telling her story with courage and vulnerability makes a difference no matter what happens. That an act of compassion and care for a neighbor makes a difference no matter how small. That an act of mercy and forgiveness to another human being, no matter how little it may seem, somehow God uses all these small deeds, kneads them together, spreads it out through the whole world, and the kingdom of God becomes real. One of my favorite quotes from Mother Teresa. She has a line, she says, you know what? We're not called to deeds, to great deeds. We're not called to great acts of love. What we are called to is small deeds, small acts of great love. That those Small deeds are used by God to create something we find transformational. That those small deeds of great love, whether they're small deeds of forgiveness to another or of a, a random act of kindness to another or simply sitting and listening to the story of a neighbor those don't seem like grand things that will really change the world, but the point is, they do, and you matter, and what you do matters. It makes a difference. And the truth is, we only have to look at history to see this arc of justice and realize that we always, for instance, in the struggle over slavery, uh, we point to the Civil War, we point to the great acts of Abraham Lincoln, the great acts of those uh, who, who accomplished and, 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 and should be honored for the elimination, the abolition of slavery. But the truth is, a hundred years before that, there were these small groups of people, more often than not Quakers, but small groups of people who were working towards abolition of slavery. 
He tried to hold up a mirror to society. It was, in some ways, one might think meaningless because what they did, it was almost impossible to imagine it would accomplish something. But actually, the elimination of slavery occurred because of those small acts over a long time. Or we might point at the civil rights movement and point at the, the, the protests and Martin Luther King and the great acts of, of those who, who, who engaged in our history at that time to, to challenge us to reimagine, to, to rethink our society and civil rights. But the truth is, 50 years before that happened, 50 years before we saw this amazing thing happen, these, there were people every day doing the small things to be the yeast that eventually would build into something new. What you do matters. You may not think it makes a difference, but the kingdom of God is like yeast that a woman takes and mixes in with flour. And the kingdom of God of justice and peace and love is made real. To God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen.